Let's talk about nine hidden messages in Killers of the Flower Moon. They're all based on visual and verbal cues, such as sugar, silent movies, photographs, the Garden of Eden, Snow White, Pool, the Moon, Luck, and Stomachs. There will be spoilers in this video, so consider yourself warned. Let's start with Sugar. Sugar is without a doubt the most interesting motif in this movie. It's referenced a few times, like with Molly's diabetes and in a bunch of conversations. Ernest tells King Hale that he thinks Molly is sweet on him earlier in the film, and when Ernest and Molly speak in her house for the first time, she tells him, I got too much sugar, referencing her diabetes. To which Ernest replies, you can never be too sweet, can you? When Ernest reads the book on the Osage, it talks about the flower moon. I'm paraphrasing here, but the book says something like, the flower moon represents the coming of spring and signifies when flowers start to speckle the prairies as if the gods sprinkled it with sugar candy. Sugar candy. Let's focus in on diabetes because it's a great metaphor for the film. Molly has diabetes, a disease where there's too much sugar in her blood. At one point, Molly's mom Lizzie says, our blood is getting whiter, staring at Ernest and Molly's kids. I thought this was interesting. If you literally think of sugar in the blood, you might think of white particles passing through our veins which would, in fact, make our blood whiter. I know it doesn't scientifically work like that, but it makes sense as a metaphor. Molly's struggle with diabetes eventually kills her. But if you think of sugar as a metaphor for the evil white people trying to take the Osage wealth, they prove to be just as deadly. As she and the Osage tribe get closer to King Hale and other whites looking to take their money, they start dying off one by one. Sugar is a reference to something that seems harmless, but is as lethal as a heart attack. It's sweet, comforting, and so delicious, you'd swear there's nothing wrong with it. Kind of like Ernest and William Hale. But have too much sugar, and it will slowly poison you over time, giving you a variety of deadly diseases and conditions. Also kind of like Ernest and William Hale. This slow infiltration of white folk into the Osage community, which eventually led to unthinkable violence, murder, and theft, fits with the comparison to sugar, a seemingly wonderful substance that does damage to your body behind the scenes. Silent Movies When Mr. Hale and Ernest meet for the first time, William tells him that the Indians don't talk that much. Throughout the movie, this is true. They're very quiet. Early in the film, a few cars race down Fairfax's main street. All the white folk hoot and holler, watching them go, while the Indians sit there quiet and unattached. When Molly invites Ernest into her home, it starts to rain. She tells him they need to be quiet for a while, which she has trouble doing. Many scenes with Molly's mother Lizzie are dead silent. Like when the owl comes to visit her, the music in the house stops during her vision. And when she dies, she wakes up to the sight of three Osage members. It's dead silent then as well. This trend continues with the silent film's Scorsese intercuts throughout the film. At the beginning of the movie, scenes of Osage people dying are intercut with silent films of their talents. We also have many scenes where characters are watching silent movies in the town theater. What does it mean? Well, I was shocked at how quiet a lot of these murders were. They just kind of happen without much fanfare or dramatic tension. It almost took the evil out of them. Oh look, another person died. For instance, a mother gets shot early in the movie next to her baby's crib, and the baby doesn't even cry. There's not a lot of commotion afterwards either. The killer simply plants the gun on her and leaves as if he just dropped something off on somebody's front porch. Even the gunshots are very muted in this movie. Scorsese, I believe, did this for a reason, to showcase how much nobody cared about any of this, how quiet it really was. My friend John lived in Tulsa for a time and says he never heard about these murders. Like Scorsese says in his cameo at the end of the film, there was no mention of these murders in Molly's obituary. And how does the film end? Ironically, with a radio presentation of this story with all the exaggerated sound effects to accentuate the story as a bunch of rich white people look on, detached from the bloody reality of what actually happened. Photographs. 
A big theme of this movie is that things are often very different from how they look on the outside. Photographs and short films accentuate this point perfectly. For example, Scorsese hard cuts between shots of Indians doing awesome things on silent B-roll films to them on their deathbed. We watch a short film on how the Osage Indians are the richest people per capita on planet Earth, yet they're wasting away under the influence of liquor, gambling, and money in real life. Even when President Coolidge meets with the Indians in front of the White House, they take one picture, he listens to Molly for 15 seconds, then he leaves, even though it's clear more Indian men wanted to talk to him. All of it was a publicity stunt to make it seem like we were really doing something for the Indians. Speaking of reality, what does Molly ask numerous times as she throttles in and out of consciousness while sick? Are you real? She asks. What's real and not real? William Hale acting like a friend of the Osage while systematically killing them off one by one? Or how Ernest acts like a loving husband all while murdering Molly's sister? I think at the core, the silent movie motif ties back into this. What we see isn't always the reality. For half the movie, I actually thought Ernest was just a nitwit who had no idea what was happening. Come to find out, to my horror, he was very much a part of these murders. It's a silent evil, like the silent movie shown numerous times in this film, a silent evil that appears like one thing, while masking something else way more sinister. The Garden of Eden There's so many references to snakes, apples, and devils in this movie, it's hard for me to not include the Garden of Eden as a possible motif. It makes a ton of sense, too, because in the story, Lucifer tricks Adam and Eve into eating the forbidden apple and changes the course of mankind. Much like Ernest and William Hale do with the Osage Indians, tricking them into thinking they're just there to help. For one, Anna calls Ernest a snake every chance she gets. She calls him a snake to his face in their final conversation, and even makes biting motions with her hand towards his stomach, which is another motif we'll get to. One of the characters in this movie, when talking about a dead man, says that he's down with the snakes, meaning he's down in hell right now. And did you notice what the Osage people place on top of caskets that are lowered into the ground? That's right, apples. They place two on Lizzie's casket and one on Anna's casket in the film. All these references fit neatly with the Garden of Eden story. Snow White There's one sneaky motif in Killers of the Flower Moon that sounds ridiculous but makes a lot of sense when you think about it. All throughout this movie, we see Indians laying dead in their beds with hands folded over their bellies. Even after Rita's house gets blown to bits, we see her laying there, immaculate, hands folded over her stomach on a piece of board. All of these bodies are white as snow, too. Did you notice that? They're extraordinarily white. There's so many shots of people sleeping or lying dead in bed in this movie, kind of like Snow White does in her everlasting sleep. Snow White, for a refresher, is the fairest of them all, and her beauty is heavily coveted by the evil queen. So the queen disguises herself and gives Snow White a poisoned apple to eat, which throws her into an everlasting sleep that only true love's kiss can break her from. Kind of like how the whites envy the wealth of the Osage and poison them to get it. We've already seen that apples are shown a few times in this movie, as they're placed on Indian caskets while lowered into the ground. Could Scorsese be using these images to reference subtly comparisons between this true story and the tale of Snow White? I think so, especially when we consider the white folks are poisoning a lot of the Indians to bring about a faster death, and we've already made a huge case about the film's obsession with white versus color. If Scorsese was ever going to compare the story to an old fairy tale, Snow White, if only for its namesake, would be the perfect choice. Pool. One of my weirder theories is that pool is a hidden motif in Killer of the Flower Moon. At the town barber shop, a row of pool tables line the right wall. We see Ernest playing pool a couple times in the movie with various characters, including King Hale. Think about pool. Think about all the components of it. There's one solid white ball used to initiate all the action in the game, and 15 colored balls you knock into the pockets one by one. To end the game, you knock the black ball into the final pocket. For a movie that talks so much about whites versus blacks, reds, and everyone else, I can see how a game like Pool fits into this theme. Also, the white ball is always the one that initiates all the chaos in Pool. 
that kind of fits in with Killers of the Flower Moon, as King Hale and Ernest systematically eliminate people of different colors throughout the movie, one by one, initiating the action through which everybody else reacts. The Moon There's a ton of moon references in Killers of the Flower Moon. Shocking, I know. In the first few minutes, Henry takes a picture at Fairfax with a moon cut out in the foreground. They regularly talk about moonshine, one of the drinks they brew in the backwoods. And we all know what a flower moon is, which brings flowers that pop out of the ground in spring, signaling the changing of the seasons. But there's one small line in this film that accentuates this motif even further. While at breakfast, an old man and woman talk about Ernest and Molly's children, saying that one is so white you'd barely recognize they're a half-breed, while the other's as dark as the moon. The older man says, it's like an eclipse, one dark and one light. The Lord put his hand over the earth and made it shake for nothing. Using the sun and moon as a metaphor for white versus dark is interesting, and fits with the themes of this movie. Just a quick note, this black versus white theme comes up in the silent black and white short films and photographs that are shown in the movie as well. We also have numerous references to coyotes and wolves in this movie, which have been known to howl at the moon. Molly calls Ernest a coyote many times, and Ernest reads about Oklahoma being the land where wolves roam at night. They also leave a dead dog on Bill's front lawn before they assassinate him. If the Osage represent the moon, and the whites represent the wolves, the wolves howling at the moon makes a whole lot of metaphorical sense in the story. That's exactly what they do, trying to get the attention of the locals, being wolves in sheep's clothing, howling at them every chance they can get for their money and women. Luck. In Ernest's first meeting with William Hale, he says the Osage people are unlucky, a weird thing to say about a group of Indians who found oil on their land and became the richest people on planet Earth. Near the end of the film, as King talks to Tom White for the first time, he describes the murders as plain bad luck. Finally, one night Ernest and his brother go rob some jewels from a rich couple in Fairfax, and do you remember what they do afterwards? They immediately gamble it away playing poker, a game of luck. King calls the Osage unlucky because their history was a rough run. They moved to Oklahoma from Missouri, and the book describes Oklahoma as a rough land where famine walked by day and wolves walked by night. Sure, they struck it lucky finding oil on their land, but it turned out to be more of a curse. It led to murder, debauchery, and a slow destruction of their culture, referenced many times by the Osage elders. In fact, the Osage were unlucky to find oil on their land, all things considered. Stomachs. Killers of the Flower Moon references stomachs a ton. For one, Ernest says he's got a busted gut that he got in the war. Later, while he talks to Molly, Ernest says, you pretend to be severe, but you got a soft belly on the inside there. When Ernest and Molly kiss for the first time in a nearby car, he touches her belly with his hand and talks about how different his color is from hers. Anna tells Ernest, you trying to get rid of me, snake? Right before she's taken off to be assassinated by his brother. Like I said before, as she does this, she makes biting motions with her hands into Ernest's stomach, like a snake. William Hale says his stomach is torn up at the end of the movie when he tries to get Ernest to sign a piece of paper. And how does Ernest inject the insulin into Molly? He does so via the stomach most times. I don't see this as anything more than a metaphor for predators turning their prey over to discover their soft underbelly. William Hale says his stomach is hurting him right as the FBI closes in around him. Ernest jokes with Molly, telling her she has a soft underbelly, which is true. She got caught up in all this mess because she was too trusting. Ernest injected the poison directly into her stomach for crying out loud. In this movie that discusses coyotes, wolves, snakes, and other predators like buzzards, the soft underbelly motif makes sense and runs like a thread throughout this movie too. That's all I wrote for Killers of the Flower Moon today. What did you think of this movie? Did you see any motifs that I missed? I'd love to hear from you down below.